Okay, the bell is rung, so we will begin. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Scott. I'll be moderating this panel, and this panel is titled Problem Offenders. Um, again, apologies. I'll say this for the third time today, but we've structured these panels that I've been moderating around uh, Marcus Felsen and Larry Cohen's routine activities theory, which postulates that for crime to occur, a motivated offender must encounter a suitable target or victim in some place that lacks capable guardianship. So this idea of offenders, victims, places has been a useful construct for the police increasingly across the world. And so in thinking about the, the projects that we're presenting to you, some of them, all of them involve offenders, victims, and places, but some more than others emphasize one of those three. So these two presentations, although they have elements of place in, in them and implications for victims, they're really focused on the offenders and new ways of thinking about dealing with especially prolific offenders. So we'll have two presentations, and the first will be from the city of Aurora, Illinois, and presenting it will be Professor Brandon Coy from Aurora University. Brandon? Okay. So this um, project is long, lasting. Um, like a lot of uh, pop projects, we seem to find some really short-term projects. Um, this one is kind of a story of a, of a decade. Um, and it's a little bit personal in that uh, I started teaching at Aurora University in uh, January 2006. And in looking at housing in the area and so forth, we began to hear stories about the sort of reputation of Aurora. And for those that might not know, it's the second largest city in the state of Illinois next to, uh, of course, Chicago. Um, and we started hearing about sort of violence and gang activity and so forth, and that was intriguing for me, of course, because I was teaching for uh, the main university in town um, as well. So in terms of the original presentation, we did this for a Goldstein finalist in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Um, the chief at the time, who's now uh, retired, but he actually works for the Darien, Illinois Police Department, Greg Thomas, uh, Clayton Mohammed, a founder of uh, Boys to Men, which you'll hear about here shortly, and uh, one of my criminal justice students, Ignacio Cervantes, had made the trip when we originally presented um, this uh, project. Um, again, the city of Aurora, for those that might not be familiar, talking about the second largest city in the uh, state, uh, population well over 200,000 uh, today, uh, and it sits just west of uh, Chicago um, in what we'd call the uh, suburbs. So we're talking about a pretty uh, large city, um, about 32,000 undocumented um, Hispanics, um, primarily within the city. Uh, the Mix there, about 41% Hispanic, about 40% uh, Caucasian, about 11% African American in general in terms of the demographic makeup uh, of the city. Um, again, this is the second largest municipal department. You got about 290 uh, sworn officers, about 75 non sworn. Um, they refer to it as sort of a flattened uh, hierarchy in that about 16% are in uh, sort of managerial uh, positions. Um, so they've done their best to keep the vast majority um, out on the road doing that sort of traditional uh, patrol um, aspect. Again, this is what um, the command staff sort of look like um, with the lieutenants and so forth underneath at the time that we did the original presentation. This is the current uh, command staff. Um, Chief uh, Kristen Zeman um, took over after Chief Greg Thomas. Uh, she now has one deputy chief and uh, three commanders. So we'll kind of get to what's happened in the last four or five years um, in the aftermath, but this is what the uh, current uh, command staff looks like at the uh, Aurora Police Department. So what we're looking at um, is really two decades long reputation of gang violence. Uh, from 1990 through 1999, the city experienced 163 murders. Um, and what was surprising to me, in 2002, you experienced 26 murders, which was the same as uh, 1996. Um, so where you see the rest of the country sort of declining in violence, you didn't really see that in, in the city of Aurora. Uh, and it certainly had, uh, again, this reputation, which I'm sure you're going to get from this video, um, which really tells uh, the tale if you will, in terms of the story and problem. of the world. We've got to warn you, this report has graphic footage. Just 40 miles west of Chicago, Aurora, Illinois, is a small city with a vibrant economy. New housing developments and businesses, including a floating casino moored along the river walk downtown, all seem to promise a bright future. Killings are 
destroying the very fabric of our society. Our Father, who art in heaven, this crowd's frightened community. I'm very scared walking the streets. Uh, this is gonna sound funny. I, I'm i 23 years old. I, I don't leave the house after eight o'clock. They're not afraid of dying. So when you got a child not afraid of dying, you're not afraid to kill. With juveniles committing more violent crimes than ever before, youth gangs have emerged as a serious public health and safety issue. Here in Aurora, Illinois, the per capita homicide rate is among the highest in the nation. Children are dying, and kids and gangs are responsible for most of the murders. How many shootings have you seen? How many murders have you seen in your neighborhood? Man, God, oh. People die every day. Every day. Eight major gangs are waging war on the community. Eight major gangs are waging war on the streets of Aurora. Crack cocaine. I don't see my lawyer. Crack cocaine. 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 Crack but more than ever, guns. Do I see myself as a judge of human nature? I see myself as an executioner of human nature. As a leader of the Vice Lords, Hurricane admits he's been locked up 20 times in his 25 years, but he sees jail as a temporary inconvenience. But if you get in a, in a shootout, you take someone's life, you can end up the rest of your life behind those walls. That's if I get caught. <laughs> I ain't gonna get caught. Finding gang members to talk with us took weeks of building trust. They don't like to draw attention to themselves, but on neutral territory, members of rival gangs spoke openly. You've been shot. Twice. Huh? Yeah. Let me see what happened to you. What plans do you have for your future? I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die someday. Getting high all day. No plans for the future and no parents to guide them. Many kids deal drugs to make a living. Lieutenant John Perkins says Aurora police have been tracking gangs since the 80s. In the past, we'd have a lot of physical violence or beatings, if you will. And now it seems like they just resort to guns and shoot each other if they got a problem. When was the last uh, gang-related homicide in this town? Uh, three days ago. You don't have to count back that far. It doesn't take too long sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. And these battles claim innocent victims. Our son is no longer there in the morning. He's no longer there to pick some breakfast or lunch. On November... Yeah. The murder is still unsolved. None no, of people are getting involved to help. Gang intimidation of witnesses is a major obstacle to solving crimes here. There are currently 58 unsolved murders. The only thing they know is intimidation, whether it's a detective they're trying to intimidate, a police officer, or the community, that's how they survive, and that's uh, they're very good at it, to be honest with you. But the Aurora police say they are undeterred by threats. On the east side of town, the SWAT team responds to reports of shots fired in a gang hood. Innocent neighbors looked on. Police evacuated residents of the building who were not involved in the incident. It was painful to see the innocent children caught in this drama. Their parents, terrified living there, too poor to move. After a four-hour standoff, police move in, flushing defiant suspects from the home. Aurora's police are making a difference, but gangsters like Hurricane say their gang nation is stronger than ever. Say six years ago, we was at least 15, 20, uh, 20 strong. Look at us now, we in the hundreds, thousands. Okay, <laughs> so we have a problem here, yes? If you don't control the message, the message will control you. Love to show this kind of message to chiefs across the country in that we know that the media at times will run with something if we're not going to try to feed them the proper information. One thing that you heard, there's murders going on every day. Everybody dies every day. Of course that's not true, not even close, right? One of the good things that you heard, which is interesting from an analytical standpoint, is that we have 58 unsolved murders that right away goes to the question of legitimacy. Um, like we did uh, in an old project that I did up in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, um, that was also a Goldstein finalist known as Neighbors Against Drugs, is to get out front, become transparent, call it an epidemic, so that it becomes uh, everybody's problem. 
in terms of when you begin to look at what is the real problem, we looked at the gang literature in general, um, that we found that oftentimes young teens um, have self-esteem issues. Uh, I have my um, two daughters in the audience and looking at um, issues that they will have as teens with regards to how do I get self-confidence and self-esteem that oftentimes we know that groups will become enormously influential with regards to giving them group esteem. What we find is that gang activity is very similar to the military in terms of depersonalizing individuals where they'll have this sense of anonymity that will feed into um, the gang activity. So understanding that group identity is a really important uh, component in terms of beginning to scan the issue. Um, in addition, what we found was that a meta-analysis of gang literature across the country and looking at youth gun violence is that many communities would look for gang membership suppression, in other words, taking out the leadership. Perhaps you might look at figuring out ways to get youth to exit the gang in terms of intervention, and perhaps you may do two things which would look at community prevention. What was glaring from the literature is that there were very few communities out there that concentrated on comprehensively doing all three. So one of the themes that you're going to see here is this idea of individual suppression, um, intervention in a very targeted way, and community-wide prevention. I think this is where this city was enormously successful because they're one of the few to really do this in a comprehensive way. So, again, the first is to look at the suppression of those individual offenders, knowing from, again, the literature that these collective experiences are uh, giving that individual anonymity. Um, the literature will tell us in good detail that there's a very small percentage of offenders that are actually chronic, um, that are essentially disease spreaders, um, and you have to do something about that. Um, in terms of groups, um, I got this from David Kennedy, um, and everybody sort of laughs when you say it, but there's no dumber organism on the planet than a young man with his friends watching. Certainly this is true when you look at a lot of the gang activity. Of course, not all of it's violent. Um, a lot of it just has to do with that street script that they begin to follow that begins to justify um, some of their behavior. The idea here is that we need to find ways to tap into the community informal social control mechanisms to mitigate what the gang is teaching in terms of that improper behavior. Certainly this is a lot less threatening than that formal criminal justice system and arrest authority uh, would do, um, and it shouldn't be seen as the same as uh, deterrence theories. Um, and then again, this third component, the prevention from a community-wide perspective, uh, clearly the police had opportunities to work on legitimacy and procedural justice. Um, the community, when you have 58 unsolved murders, that's telling a story that um, there's the expectation that the police are uh, supposed to police for you. We need to begin to send the message that we're here to police with you um, and begin to determine within that community who can we begin to rely on as relevant stakeholders who are going to sustain any kind of uh, uh, response that would deal with suppression. Um, so again, it's glaring in terms of what happens with cities that have these levels of violence. Um, this particular uh, news article shows a reverend who would uh, hold prayer vigils around uh, every murder scene. Uh, in the bottom right corner, you can see the tally in terms of uh, murders year after year. Um, so you can imagine how sort of gripping and how important it is to understand this type of media coverage and also from the religious aspect, that kind of coverage where you have these prayer vigils around uh, every murder. Um, what did this look like? Um, 1996 through 2007, um, you see this sort of wave after wave, um, but the drops weren't sustainable. Um, in the 21st century, we're averaging uh, one murder uh, a month, and again, you could see that spike in uh, 2007. Um, 1980s, we had 53 murders. 1990, 163 murders. Um, 1990s look a lot different in the city of Aurora um, than the 1990s. A um, lot of gang activity, a lot of variation in terms of gangs um, to look at in terms of membership. These are difficult numbers to track. If you remember the video, they said we number in the thousands. They don't number it in thousands, so it's important, again, to control um, that message. Um, pass initiatives, really Really important as well to look at things that didn't work. Um, clearly, zero tolerance policing um, was not very effective. The city was good at um, doing this. Um, gun recoveries, gun buybacks, you see this happening all over the country to this day. Um, the idea that uh, the insane deuces and the Latin kings are waiting in line to sell their guns. 
right? Give me a break. That's not uh, happening. So we don't see gun buybacks uh, being very effective. Um, clearly, if you have 58 unsolved murders, you're not finding a lot of witnesses that are cooperative uh, with the police. Um, in addition, they tried uh, ceasefire. Um, essentially, what they found was hiring former gang members to come in and try to um, talk other gang members out of shootings, at least for the Aurora story, didn't seem to be very effective. Um, there wasn't a really good relationship with law enforcement um, and these other groups to share information. Um, um, and they essentially asked for that federal grant not to uh, continue. So they needed something new uh, and different to begin to rely on. So um, looking at past responses, actually uh, creating more fear and more mistrust um, seemed to be part of uh, the story. So um, doing a different kind of analysis. Um, this is Mary Anderson. Um, interesting story here. She comes from Alabama. Uh, the story is November 1902, winter of 1902. She's in New York City on a trolley. Um, and there's freezing rain that is literally hitting everybody in the face that's on the trolley, and she sees everybody with uh, blankets and covering up, and she's thinking, why the heck doesn't the driver of the trolley close the windshield? Well, the reason why is because they didn't have windshield wipers at that time. So she's right away thinking, this is ludicrous. Why are these people doing this? She goes back to Alabama, and she's known to be the inventor of windshield wipers. The story I think is important is because oftentimes we get accustomed to the status quo. We get used to SWAT teams rolling into drug houses. The expectation is, well, eventually they're going to get the message and they're going to be deterred and they're going to put down their guns and stop shooting one another. And we do the same thing over and over and over again. I love when you see the new officer with the fresh new eyes that begins to question that status quo, that pushes the envelope and says, can we do a better job of analytically understanding what's going on here and helping that analysis drive more creative responses? Um, so that was essentially, I think, what was going on here in the city of Aurora. Um, 251 shootings yearly, um, and you're looking at an average of 15 murders going on uh, every year up until that stop point of, again, 2007. Um, the victims and the offenders mirror one another. 94% uh, of gang members in the city uh, were found to be minority. 93% of murder victims were also seen as minority, but only 52% of the general population. So we had to look at, this is uh, primarily an Hispanic, African-American issue um, to solve. Um, and again, being transparent with that kind of data, I think, um, is important. If we look at that crime triangle, again, victims, offenders, basically the same people. Um, again, those offenders following some of those crime scripts. Um, and we knew that in those locations where crime was uh, hotspot areas, um, there's no legitimacy in terms of how the police are doing the job. In other words, that there's not levers uh, that are adequate enough to be able to pull amongst those people that are living there um, in order to help us solve the problem. So this was going to take some time in terms of forming those relationships that had been scarred. Um, not going to go into a lot of detail here in terms of the crime maps, but you can see kind of the overlay of uh, gang activities, um, and then you could see the shootings. No big surprise that you know they're one and the same in terms of uh, the different neighborhoods that we were looking at in terms of those risky uh, facilities. All right, so again, the response, this theme of looking at individuals, groups, and communities in terms of the comprehensive strategy, that it was important to be able to build relationships. Now, that relationship term is really important here, because if you think about this, any time that you're forming a personal relationship with somebody, that can occur on the first time you meet them, or even the second time you meet them, right? Um, there was a commander that uh, was a keynote speaker at our last uh, Illinois Problem Oriented Policing Conference. Mike Scott was great to be at the, all three of these. Um, and he made this comment that sort of stuck out, um, that you can't do business until you've had front porch time. Right? Front porch time was really important in terms of, again, forming relationships that actually mattered. This was going to take a while in terms of truly being able to shift and share responsibilities to that wider community so that we're not just suppressing and having that vacuum effect that's going to take place. Indeed, if you only do suppression, it's possible that violence is going to go up as gang members will now fight for uh, power uh, and so forth. So um, Aurora PD was great at using uh, Covey's uh, discipline of execution in terms of very clearly defining goals. Um, for example, when you look again at the uh, media headlines during this time, um, we're very transparent in terms of what's being targeted and what the crime statistics are. I don't think police departments across the nation do a good enough job of being transparent with their data um, on sort of a weekly basis. We'll give you yearly reports, but what about by month in comparison to trends and so forth? Um, so um, 
the responses then looked at um, individuals. Um, we looked at those location-oriented policing, hotspots, perpetrator-oriented policing, and then the long-term removal of certain members that were known as those typhoid marys or the disease spreaders. Um, in addition, they had some really interesting software. Again, I won't go into a lot of detail here, uh, but some of this was helpful in terms of identifying where the resources should be allocated. Um, in this particular uh, example for, um, you can find in, in one month time, there were six shootings, and it all stemmed around uh, one individual. Um, the belief is oftentimes this has to do with, of course, drugs, uh, money, and turf. Uh, what we found is oftentimes it had to do with girls, <laughs> females, uh, love triangles, and these sort of things. So being able to drill down and understand the prolific offender, what we refer to from that uh, medical perspective, the disease spreader, um, was important. So this was the offender-focused. Um, the feds were also great partners. Um, Illinois has some really strange laws in terms of two-party consent. Uh, when it comes to wiretapping, the feds don't. Um, so they became really useful in doing um, a lot of the investigations itself and essentially getting uh, witnesses to flip. Okay. So again, this is the who helped side. bring down a violent suburban gang. Tonight, you're going to see the videotapes he made that helped the feds make Aurora a safer place to live. His name is Fernando Della Torre, and he's a member of the Insane Deuce street gang in Aurora. If he looks a little nervous, it's because at this moment, he's got two hot handguns in a plastic bag, including a 9mm gun used in a murder. Della Torre's plan, as caught on this undercover videotape, is to throw them into the Fox River. Gang member Orlando Rivera can be heard explaining why. There's no way you, once you throw it in the water, there's no way they can recover the fingerprints. You don't see Rivera on camera because he's working with police helping with the recording. Rivera takes both weapons from Delatory, but instead of tossing them into the river, hides them on the bank, where police later recover them and trace them back to two unsolved shootings. Can you make a case like this without an informant flipping for you? Uh, it would be very difficult. I mean, we need to have someone on the inside. Rivera's decision to cooperate was the critical turning point in a long-time war on gang-related shootings in Aurora. The worst year was 2002. Well, there would be shootings, and then that just one shooting would lead to another retaliation shooting, which would lead to another shooting, which would lead to a homicide, you know, and then it would just go back and forth. And that was the way it was in, in 01, 02, 03, 04. Um, it was just back and forth like that. The shootings were sparked by a turf battle between the Insane Deuce and the Latin Kings, both gangs wanting to control Aurora's drug trade. Who often helped dispose of weapons was frequently with shooters right after a killing, when they were most willing to open up about what they had done. In and out, 15 minutes, flat, dumb, in and out. After uh, you, there was a shooting or you did a, 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 a were ordered to kill someone, the shooter would be very pumped up almost like after an athletic competition. They're pumped up and they want to talk a lot. So it was easy for the informant to elicit incriminating conversation in great detail about, about who they shot, how they did it, who ordered it, where they did it, which of course and it was very damning when it came to the actual trials. Eventually, Rivera's cooperation led to the conviction of Fernando Della Torre and 14 other gang members, seven of whom were sentenced to life in prison. Taking down the leadership of the Insane Deuces has not totally eliminated Aurora's gang problems, but the number of gang-related crimes, especially shootings, has dropped dramatically. Okay, so again, this is one part of the response here, suppression of those individual offenders. Again, feds did great work, local police did great work in terms of uh, the partnership that was going on. In terms of uh, groups intervention, um, what we found was knock and talks tended to be very effective as well. Uh, police officers going around the community educating people in terms of what gang activity looked like. If parents see a Latin King symbol on their kid's notebook to begin to question and ask about that. This was important in terms of capacity building, again, if you follow that sort of medical perspective that we're providing the community with the necessary medicine in order to long term begin to inoculate itself against potential gang uh, activity. Uh, graffiti removal, crime-free housing all became part of this as well. Um, and 
providing, again, the statistics and the goals. So not only the police department um, knowing what those goals are, but the wider community um, as well. Uh, Crime-free housing was something fairly new uh, to the city in uh, 2007, uh, 2008 um, as well. Um, so the goal, again, inoculating future disease spreaders in addition to uh, suppression. Um, then we move into um, the larger community prevention perspective. Again, the message that we need to police with you and not for you. Um, the East Aurora High School um, bolds the largest junior ROTC program uh, for the Navy in the nation. Um, they've really turned around what they did. Uh, at Aurora University, we offer uh, My Time, which is a youth mentoring program that a lot of our university students get involved with. Um, and then the Boys to Men uh, perspective, I'm also going to tell you about, again, the founder of this, Clayton Mohammed, who you'll see here shortly in this uh, video, uh, just has done phenomenal work and worked directly for uh, the mayor's office at this time. Um, and we found this side of the response um, was enormously effective. Everyone seems to agree it'll take more than extra officers on the streets to stop the violence. So tonight, we take you to Aurora to see what's worked there, where no homicides were recorded in 2012. ABC7's Stacey Baca, they're live. Stacey? Ron, the words we heard tonight is weed and seed. Aurora police are weeding out the gangs and the gun violence, but the seed part is equally as important. You can see that a party just ended here just a short time ago, and this was a celebration, really celebrating young men for all the right reasons. Young men, elementary students to college graduates, are honored tonight, recognized as Aurora success stories. When we can shine a light on all things positive, when we can shine a light on young men who are excellent, when we can shine a light on young men who are phenomenal, not only do their peers see that and get encouraged, the next generation sees that and become encouraged as well. Clean Muhammad is the founder of Boys to Men, an organization, a brotherhood that focuses on education and discipline. Tonight, 100 young men receive awards for academic excellence. When you're surrounded by excellence, the only thing you can do is rise to the occasion. So I'd say this group really definitely has helped me. This program is one pillar that has helped Aurora accomplish a critical goal. In 2002, Aurora had 26 homicides. That dropped to zero in 2012. I don't think there's one program, one Operation XYZ to make it work. It's a lot of cooperation from a lot of different individuals. Voice to Men is one part. Aurora officials say law enforcement, educators, clergy members, after-school programs all played a role. Collaboration isn't always easy among organizations. You know, there's always a little bit of ego, a little bit of turf. If you put that aside uh, and work together, you can get a lot done. Tonight, five men received the Phenomenal Man of the Year Award. College grads, success they say must be a choice. You see these gangs, and I mean, how big they used to be in Aurora, and I mean, they're slowly getting, you know, pushed out the door because you have positive things like this. I mean, nearly a thousand people here tonight just to support academic success. Police say this hasn't been an easy task and that a fight still continues for them, but really it's been a cultural change, one of violence to cooperation. Reporting live. Okay, so clearly one of the things that I hope that you saw in that video is that there was a, a cultural shift. We began to change the script. When you have a thousand people from your community showing up for a so-called graduation, it's not an actual graduation, but it's just this group of kids coming together called the Phenomenal Man of the Year, and you can have kids talking about educational success and having that pride and passion in it, you've begun to change the script for your most at-risk youth. Um, this is a really important part that I think most communities miss out on because there's a lot of work that does take place in doing this. So what did this look like? If we compare the five years versus five years of data, um, essentially from 2007 through 2012, you got a 49% uh, decrease um, in um, murders. Um, I'm sorry, in, in shootings. Um, so you went from 156 shootings to 79 shootings. And then you have a 78% a uh, five-year decrease. So uh, Ron Clark early on called this the cliff edge drop. I'm not sure if you would call it that, but 78% is a pretty big drop. Um, again, in 2012, this is what made the media headlines, of course. Um, zero murders, first time since 1946 that the city of Aurora um, had a full year go um, without murders. Okay, so now the big question is, um, was it sustainable? 
Again, that seems to be an ongoing theme that we've heard throughout the conference. Is it sustainable? Well, um, not quite sure. All right, so this is what um, this looks like. Um, clearly, we've had uh, some increases. 2013, you got four. Uh, 14, you got eight. Um, up uh, to nine in 2015. So um, they're not hitting zero by any means. Um, you know, what's the reason? Don't know. Want to dive into that. Uh, that could come up in questions and answers. Um, I know one of the more interesting concepts that I've heard coming from police officers is this concept of cyber banging, uh, where essentially over the use of social media, you'll have gang members taunting one another, and that eventually will lead to shootings and violence based upon uh, what's going on in the social media. Um, easy for law enforcement, of course, to follow this and react to it in terms of their investigations, uh, but in terms of you know, adequate prevention of it, I'm not uh, quite sure uh, where they're at. So really a question of sustainability without um, a doubt. Um, so kind of quickly go through the assessment here. Um, again, suppression, important to control the message. Police have to have ability to market their business in a way that gears it towards problem policing and prevention. These kind of headings will sell every time. Anytime that you're having gang leaders busted, you're talking about federal gang sweeps, these kind of things will sell. But they'll also sell what the public already knows from Hollywood, that this is what cops do. They react and they take out gang leaders. And of course, the police are oftentimes good at telling this part of the story as well. So I think that it's important to do this, especially when you're talking about solving a lot of unsolved murders and trying to change the focus. Uh, but this can't be the only thing that we're selling to um, the media in terms of what is adequate in terms of a uh, police business and what we're trying to uh, get accomplished. Um, but this was certainly part of uh, the overall suppression. Okay. In terms of intervention with uh, groups, um, estimates were that there's a lot less gang members that were involved. Um, 2003 to 2007 estimates were 78% of the murders uh, within the city were gang related. Um, there's always going to be shootings and murders in the city of Aurora, uh, but it seems that there's a much lower percentage of those that can be affiliated directly to uh, the gang activity. So that group intervention seemed to be adequate and worked as well. Uh, again, in terms of uh, community prevention, uh, perhaps we'll use that term super controller as well um, and looking at um, the ways that this might be effective as well. Robin, while Chicago has spent much of this year coping with an epidemic of violence, Illinois' second largest city, Aurora, is quietly enjoying a big reduction in shootings and homicides. How do they do it? And are there lessons for Chicago, a city approaching the tipping point? Our Larry Yellen has the story. Kids playing in Aurora's parks, something you might not have seen a few years ago when the city was overrun with street gangs committing murders. Did you feel comfortable having your kids run free and play on the streets? Not before. I wouldn't tell you before. It was like real bad. It, it was... It was pretty bad. Police Chief Greg Thomas remembers working the streets when Aurora averaged hundreds of shootings and 16 homicides every year. You know, I remember going to call after call, shooting after shooting. Um, uh, you know, and they were really almost band-aid approaches where you're going there and you're collecting evidence as fast as you can because you needed to get to the next call. So just how did things get turned around? Enrique Ruiz, once a gang member himself... Okay, so a lot of, again comprehensive strategies that go into play here um, in terms of uh, seeing that statistical success um, that we looked at. Um, not sure this one is a, um, this one might not work. I didn't, okay. Um, so uh, kind of sum up here. Um, this was kind of a, a neat graph that... Uh, it's been called the anti-gang, and for some it has meant the difference between a life on the street and a chance at a college education. Okay. Through hard work and a sense of family, one very special group in Aurora is helping boys become men. NBC5's Alex Perez reports. As you watch them walk into a room, their confidence stands out. When you hear their name, you might expect this band of unlikely brothers to break out in song, Boys to Men. No matter what race you are, what school you go to, what side of town you live on, every boy wants to become a man. But these Boys to Men are more about teaching success rather than singing. The friends and the decisions I was making. I was headed in the wrong way. 18-year-old Tavis Gibson grew up in East Aurora and joined the mentoring program when he was in fifth grade and admits he probably would have dropped out of high school and college would have been an afterthought were it not for the group. When you're surrounded by greatness, you really have no choice but to conform to the same status that they're going to be. So it pushes me. Don't waste your time falling behind and just manifest your destiny. 
After four years of Boys to Men, Jomar Mendoza has earned more than $300,000 in college scholarships. I was just inspired to live out my full potential, and that's when I, I stepped up everything, and that's where I got me where I'm at right now. Boys to Men is the brainchild of Clayton Muhammad. He came up with the idea for the mentorship program in 2002 after one of Aurora's most deadly summers, 25 murders that year. We got so tired of uh, going to funeral after funeral of young people who, you know, we should be going to graduation parties. I know I have naturally what most men like. I'm a man is in some cases the only adult mentor some of these students have. He teams up with other agencies to offer tutoring and guidance. Full membership is open to young men between 8th and 12th grades and they must commit to attending Sunday night meetings at least twice a month. Be able to have a peer to reach out to and to relate to makes a world of difference because now they have someone who has quote unquote been there, done that. Boys to Men has gotten an endorsement from and works hand in hand with law enforcement. Gang uh, affiliation and uh, drug sales will really be a thing of the past for this community. That's, that's the ultimate goal. In eight years, Boys to Men has spread to a dozen schools across the suburban area. Some 200 students have gone through the program. All of them, 100%, have graduated from high school. 11-year-old Meliton Chidas is a junior member and says the group has already taught him an important lesson. Not everything is having fun. Sometimes you have to work hard to get have fun. As they continue giving boys an earful of how to become men, these young leaders want to make sure the future ends up in a galaxy of success. Even if you shoot for the moon and you miss, you still land among stars. Okay. All right, so power of uh, social psychology, I think, is uh, very important here um, with regards to you know, some of the success that we saw. Hold on. <laughs> I can't read the language. So. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how to exit that one. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so some up here. All right. So looking at, again, the, the effectiveness of the uh, community intervention uh, and the community crime prevention aspect was important. Um, the one gr last graph I wanted to show you here was looking at um, the UCR data uh, in comparison to the population growth. And you can see right around that 2006-07 time frame, it really begins to change and that population growth continues to go up, but that rate of uh, the UCR part one crime for the first time uh, ended up going down where you can see the enormous gap in the 80s and the 90s and really into the 21st century as well. Um, this freed up the police department to do a lot of other uh, kind of work um, as well. So I think main points here, you got to focus in on that gang, gang cohesion, uh, impact cohesion, pay attention to the social identities that your youth um, are having, figure out what community groups that you have for your youth to identify with, uh, make sure that there's a variety, and understand the street scripts. We need to have uh, more of uh, the one-on-one -on -one conversations with our kids to really understand some of the threats and things that they're dealing with uh, throughout their lives um, and what other kind of groups that they're going to be, uh, become affiliated with, um, and ultimately implement comprehensive strategies that are going to include the individual group uh, and identities um, so that you, know, you can prevent that next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, so the second presentation, um, sort of near and dear to my heart, and that it's coming from the, my hometown, city of Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, this also is dealing with problem offenders. The presentation will be by two gentlemen who are both leaders in both this initiative and the, the Madison Police Department, Tom Woodman C. and Noble Ray. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Oh, there we go. There we go. Good afternoon. Uh, before I get started, I would like to just say one thing. Um, as um, as uh, uh, Scott, Michael Scott alluded to, um, coming from Madison, Wisconsin, I had the honor, it was truly the honor of having Herman right there and access to him. And a lot of times when we're talking about this particular topic, we'll talk about it from an analytical standpoint, the charts, the numbers. But I have to say, that his, his impact on this profession has really brought the humanity out in what we do on a daily basis. And so I've, uh, it's, it's really been an honor. So I was not gonna miss this and really do appreciate that. 
So let me just uh, start off by giving you a little background on me, and Tom is going to introduce himself a bit more. Um, we're going to tag team this, so we'll be looking back and forth at each other, so you'll, you'll get that, us, us going back and forth. As mentioned, my name is Noble Ray. I worked for the Madison Police Department for 30 years. I was chief of police there for almost 10. Uh, give you a little background of the department. We had uh, roughly about 450 officers. Uh, we're the capital city, uh, the city of the uh, home of the university as, as well. Um, to give you a sense of geography, uh, we're about two hours uh, north of Chicago, uh, Illinois. A um, little background uh, for con contextual purposes. Um, with a population of roughly about 225, we have historically had low crime rates, just so you get a, get a sense of that. We historically had low crime rates. Uh, roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five homicides a year, just, just as, a, as a matter of perspective. Um, so, getting into the presentation. Let me start by how, how, we, how we got here, because this is about focus deterrence. And how, how we got here, how I got here, is that uh, the history of Madison, the history of, of Wisconsin, is that we've always struggled with uh, racial disparities and to get right down to it, repeat offenders, because that's one of the drivers of, of racial disparities is uh, repeat offenders. So we've always struggled with that. Um, during my uh, tenure as chief, there were some things that helped me to see where we were, where we're going and helped me to see why focused deterrence was the way to go. One was um, this uh, program that we participated in called a Journey Home Program. It was a reentry program uh, for uh, people coming out of prison. With this reentry program, there were four aspects of it. Uh, there was the making sure that they had uh, a resident if they were coming out, making sure they had employment, making sure they had support, and making sure they have treatment. Now, you've all probably heard aspects of focused deterrence today, and some of those similar things are part of what you're doing in terms of providing uh, uh, you know, support uh, for, for repeat offenders. The last thing I'll say uh, on, on this as uh, kind of what, what brought me here is chief of police, um, it was always difficult because when the crime was going up, they focused on the crime and they wanted you to react to it. But we always knew over here is the support behind the scenes, resources, jobs, um, uh, education, and all those things were there, but you could never marry the two. So you're going to hear our attempt to try and marry the two uh, in, in our uh, presentation. Um, so, so messaging. Um, what? Uh, messaging. Um, we spend a lot of time talking to our community to prepare the community for what we're about to do with focus deterrence. That's sort of roughly about six things that uh, we'll talk about. One is we wanted them to understand what it was and be consistent with consent of a governor. Two, we wanted to be very transparent uh, about it. We went everywhere. We did a number of uh, media marketing and, and talking about it. We also uh, brought in David Kennedy, uh, and he and Herman did a presentation. Um, we developed, um, uh, we're trying to develop a network of, of uh, people in the criminal justice system and out of the criminal justice system, because part of our process in going through this, we were finding that people were operating in silos, and a lot of the information was breaking down. So we wanted to create a network, a communication network. We wanted to shine light on the process, shine light on the criminal justice system, uh, the, the Department of Corrections, as well as shine light on the people who are committing the crimes and repeat uh, committing the crimes. We wanted to use data and analysis to see how this was going, and, and Tom will talk about that um, in, in a few minutes. Um, we wanted to build this team, and we had a great team that, that we put together, both. Uh, in a criminal justice system and outside of criminal justice. But messaging, what we really wanted to get across is that we wanted to co-produce public safety. We wanted to co-produce public safety. So if, if we can go back to the, the, yeah. the other one, I, I missed that one there. Um, I want to talk a bit about the, the notification meeting, uh, because we would have a notification meeting. It's probably one of the more powerful things that I attended uh, as, a, as a police officer, one of the more powerful things that, that we attended. We had the, uh, the folks that, uh, that we're going to talk about, uh, the repeat offenders or part of the focus deterrence, in the room. They were in the room. We also had the community people that were in the room. And what the community people, uh, uh, you know, what they were there, uh, they were saying that they wanted their safety. They were saying that they wanted to help. 
And so all of those things that they were talking about really created the sense, as we were trying, trying to talk about, was co-producing uh, safety. So the notification was very powerful. We had, uh, if, if you've ever attended some of those, we had uh, criminal justice members, community members. We had people in there uh, uh, with job training, people in there, both public and private. So it's a very, very powerful um, um, uh, notification meeting. Uh, philosophically, uh, we wanted to do a couple of, couple of other things. Um, we wanted to have the moral voice come out. And the moral voice, uh, in my estimation, was uh, many times when you're looking at uh, arresting someone, so on and so forth, the victim is forgotten. So the moral voice of the victim. The moral voice of the family. So we'd have family members there. As um, you know, you've probably heard today, the influencers, the family members, the lovers, the, the, the friends. So a lot of those uh, folks would be there. But we wanted the community to talk in a restorative way uh, to the people that were impacting uh, uh, their lives. And also through their communication, create a community standard. But when it was all said and done, uh, we're, we're going to offer services, but we still have law enforcement there. And what we're going to be is very certain. So our message was very clear and very certain. So my name is Tom Woodmansey, and uh, I, I currently work as a senior advisor for a company named CNA out of uh, Washington. Um, they're a research company, and we do work for the Department of Justice on addressing uh, uh, violence in uh, helping police agencies address violence. We do projects with 21st century policing to body-worn cameras. So uh, I, I have the fortune of, of being able to go around the country uh, and work with various agencies ar around the country on their, their violent crime efforts. Um, and specifically, I, I work largely with some focused deterrence projects throughout the country. Um, and as Chief Ray mentioned, uh, our backgrounds, I was a detective for 13 years, primarily that was the majority of my time uh, as a police officer, and then he promoted me to lieutenant, and I did some time in training, and then we met, and he, he talked about wanting to address the prolific repeat offenders and, and how we, we should do it, and as Noel mentioned, we did a lot of research, so we looked at, I think, 36 different agencies around the country. Uh, we met with Mike, we met with Herman, uh, we brought David Kennedy in, and we decided that we would go with a focused deterrence approach that focused on individuals with a, with a quasi-group element. But Madison, I think we, at the time, we had 139 identified gang groups uh, in, in the city, but our violence wasn't, uh, as Brandon mentioned, is, and we're finding around the country, typically driven by geographic or gang conflicts. It was beefs, it was petty arguments. Um, so we decided to go after the heads of those arguments, the heads that were driving the crime, um, and we identified criteria, which later proved to be incredibly important in a federal lawsuit. Um, we had specific criteria of who is going to be on our list, and you can see it here, I won't read it. Uh, but we were able to articulate to the offenders, to the community, why you've been identified and singled out as somebody who needs extra attention, basically because the criminal justice system has failed you in the past, and we're gonna try and change that. So we received input both internally and externally. We actually had the district attorney's office submitting names of offenders that they wanted us to put on our list to identify and do intervention with. Uh, we did intensive backgrounds, and one of the unique things that um, I always found striking was when we, we would do the notifications and we would talk to, to the offenders, uh, and they had no, some of them had no idea how, in, in, how deep their background was, how extensive it was in violence. They, they just have been in and out of the system so many times. So we educated not only the community about what this is and, and the criteria that we have, but we educated the offenders of you need extra attention. Our message is to try and offer you support, but at the same time you're gonna get accountability like you've not had before. So one thing that, that Madison, I think, did that's somewhat unique um, from, from working around the country is that we established a notification selection committee. Uh, and this committee, uh, was very diverse, and it was comprised of the district attorney, members of the U.S. United States attorney, United Way, um, ex-offenders, uh, Madison Urban Ministry, which was one of our nonprofit support groups, um, Department of Corrections, uh, probation and parole, and federal probation and parole. We actually had three probation agents assigned directly to our unit, our focused deter deterrence unit, which was five detectives and an analysis, and myself as the commander. Uh, and 
it was basically case management, a very holistic approach to each and every individual offender. Now, a lot of agencies don't have the luxury or resources to, to assign a detective to an offender, um, but we have wonderful detectives. A lot of the work that went into designing this came from our detectives, so they were ground on the ground floor with this. Um, and so the, the philosophy that we had from the selection committee, they would meet roughly quarterly. We would give them unidentified names, unidentified races, and we would provide them with the backgrounds, not even any gang affiliation, and they would, they would vote who needed to be notified. Uh, we invited the media to sit in uh, and determine that, that this was as fair a process as we could come up with. And I still remember from the first selection committee outcome, members of the community that were on the panel were shocked that some of these offenders were walking the streets of Madison. They had no idea. They wanted to notify all of them. Um, so we base it all on behavior and articulable behavior. And the, the reality is our population is noble. Yeah, this is our population uh, breakdown of those that were part of our, our, our unit that we, were, that we were dealing with. As I mentioned before, when I started this off, we talk about repeat offenders, but the issue is really race. As you can see here, uh, we had 86% of, uh, of our participants were, were African American, on 6% white, 6% uh, Hispanic, and 2% Native American. We expected that to some degree. I mean, the, the reality is, is that that's, those disparities have been part of what we've been uh, challenged with in the city of Madison for years. So after the selection took place, the process, uh, and the notification that, that Noble talked about, uh, we found that what we learned and what we have since also learned is that focused deterrence can fail if there's not adequate follow-up. This has to be an organizational um, approach. And we also went to High Point, which originated some of the fundamental uh, approach to focus deterrence. And we, what we took away from there is you can't just tell the offenders, we're watching you, we support you, good luck. We established follow-up and protocol to offer assistance a week after the notification. We established detectives would go to their homes and contact them periodically, along with case managers from probation and parole. But what we also did is we educated our, our officers on the street level. So our goal was every Madison patrol officer would know every offender that has been put on notice. One, because it adds the element of deterrence and enforcement, but two, it's an officer safety issue. If you're gonna tell people next time you get stopped or arrested for a crime, it could be the last time we're gonna send you away for significant time in prison, potentially, that becomes a heightened risk to the officers. So it was critical that we came up with a, a process to educate our officers. Uh, so we did the bulletins. Um, could I just add, yeah, add please. Just something to that really quick? Um, you know, it's, it's really important to reemphasize the point. Uh, one is we have repeat offenders, and, and we know we have repeat offenders, but when we sat down and communicated across the system, outside of our silos, we were, we were really surprised to see that some of it was break, breaking down in our communication, breaking down in our processes that we had repeat offenders that there was sometimes driven by the system, and I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, and I want to echo too that, that what, we, what we found, and I found in working after uh, working with Noble in, in Madison, is irregardless of the size of, a, of an organization, I had lunch with uh, Kennedy and a captain from Los Angeles. Um, a lot of police departments are decentralized, and I was on a phone call last week with one from Ohio who's examining focused deterrence, and they, they said, we can identify by name our, our districts, who's driving our crime. We know who they are. Um, and even in a city the size of Los Angeles, the captain said, yeah, our districts know, our detectives know who the, the primary players who need the most intervention are. So uh, this is what I uh, just wanted to touch on, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but again, reemphasizing the significance of follow-up if you're going to implement a true focused deterrence model is you have to do more after that awareness is made. The goal, and Brandon touched on it earlier, is to change the offender's behavior. You want their mindset to be different after that, that notification meeting. And so we did that by reinforcing with, with all of this. This is something unique to Madison that, uh, that, that Noble and I came up with and it, uh, it, is pretty, it was pretty powerful. So. Yeah, this was uh, signed by the U.S. Attorney, the District Attorney, as, as well as the uh, Department of Corrections. And I also signed that as well. And it's, uh, it's notifying 
it's a, it's a symbolic way in many respects of notif notifying them that they are notified and we are united and we're going to communicate and we're going to stay plugged in and I personally would hand those to them. So. so they would, what they would do is to reinforce the message, we would have the chief, the U.S. attorney, the district attorney and correction sign this and if they went for one year uh, without committing a violent offense, and, and we learned that we have to be flexible. There are going to be times when our violent offenders are going to commit minor offenses and it has to be reasonable. Um, but what we would deliver this, this letter to them saying, to our knowledge, you have not committed a crime of, violent, of violence for the past year. We wish to congratulate you. We also wish to tell you that we are still monitoring you and support you in any way that we can help. And I've been part of delivering these as Noble has, and I've seen the offenders who are some of the most violent people in our city break down and cry and say nobody's ever uh, provided us with any support like that. One person put it next to a picture of his daughter who was seven years old on his mantle. Uh, so this turned out to be just an idea that, that actually was a, a very strong element for our approach. So here, just to touch on um, this, we did just a you know, quasi-evaluation of where we are. And if you look at it, this was, uh, if I recall, based upon 54 offenders that were first in our first group of, of notif notifications. I believe that was three notifications. Um, just to highlight a couple things, the average offender uh, of the 54 had six felony convictions in the past. Um, they had 74% of all of them had gun offenses in their past. Um, and we were a big, if you heard it earlier today, supporter of evaluating victimization. I've heard a lot about recidivism and I struggle with focused deterrence being a measurement, uh, recidivism being a measurement of that because if you are telling your offenders, you're going to get extra attention. We're going to monitor you. We're not going to give you any breaks. And they're the most likely people in your community to reoffend. And then when they reoffend and you catch them now and hold them accountable like you hadn't before, that shouldn't look like the program's failing. That's a success um, if they're held accountable. So um, we looked at victimizations. And prior to the notifications, there were 515 independent victims of crime, and that doesn't include repeat victims of child abuse or domestics. Um, Post-notification, uh, you will see that um, there were a total of 14 felony convictions, where they each averaged six, um, and there were zero gun offenses in this uh, three-year period, uh, and there were nine new victims, which uh, surprised us even, in, in all honesty. So there were some strong indications that, the, that we were having an impact on the group that we identified. And we also did a, a, a rough socioeconomic impact of money that we believe was saved, which I remember Mayor Sogwin was very excited about when we, when we showed him that, so. And then just to touch on, and, and Noel will chime in any time, uh, we just wanted to give some testimonials to some of the examples. So again, the message was accountability, we're going to treat you differently, both with support and provide you with quality of life resources like you've never had before. Um, you haven't had the opportunities before. Um, and we're also going to scrutinize you. And, and this gentleman, um, you can see in the upper right picture, this is a picture, he showed up to the notification with a bullet hole in his arm. Um, he was involved with a multiple round, it wasn't a fully automatic, but seven automatic assault rifle that it has in a mall area in Madison. And we put him on notice, very smart, very young, 23 years old, but he was a group leader of one of our local gangs, uh, very influential. Um, and he didn't take the messaging. And if you look at the lower left, right-hand corner, um, we had him on GPS monitoring. So he's, he was on uh, probation and pro monitoring. And while he was on, and after being notified, he's there delivering heroin uh, to, knowing that he's got a bracelet on. So we put extra attention on him, uh, put extra scrutiny on him. And you can see on the, the other path, there's where we followed him to his heroin delivery. So we, we, we committed, we, we met what we said, we were legitimate, we're gonna treat you differently. Um, and I believe he was sentenced to 17 years in federal prison, unfortunately. Um, so the department got a great deal of attention in the media, a great deal of support. Um, people seemed to understand what it was. Uh, one of the most impactful phone calls I had after I think our second notification was a mother calling me saying her son just committed his third bank robbery um, and can he become part of our program? 
can we get him in? And, and I, I researched it and learned that he was going to be sentenced to life in prison. Um, but we did send somebody up to talk to him. But the fact that a mother of a, a violent offender is asking for our unit uh, to assist uh, meant a lot. This is a gentleman that turned his life around. So it's difficult. Uh, you, you have to go into this as a behavioral change. And you're, you can't go in and look at it as, all right, we're going to spin their lives around by offering them resources. But when it happens, uh, it's something that is pretty impressive. And I think what we, our, our unit at the time, what a lot of us got into the profession for was to see if we can make an impact on behavior. And Tom, just, yeah, please. Just to add, add to that, a, a lot of times you'll get the, the resource people, the nonprofit, and even some uh, private sector people, they're, they're not connected. And uh, the gentleman that you saw before, um, we de he developed a network, a communication. He developed a relationship with those folks that were providing the resources and the services and support. Um, because it, you'll find, again, over and over again, there was communication breakdowns along the way, and we were building that network. And so uh, he was very complimentary of the process as well as being able to just sit down and talk to people that directly about a job. So. And so two years out, um, this is, again, how we looked at measuring success. And I, I, I quoted David Kennedy here about how it should not be how many offenders turn their lives around, which is often a societal approach to policing is what are you doing to change your lives around? We're just trying to make the city safer and the community safer. So two years out, this group that we talked about, Ford returned to prison, no weapons violations, eight new victims. We did presentations with prosecutors. We presented to all 17 circuit court judges and told them they're part of the, they're part of the responsibility for this, uh, which was kind of unique. They didn't want to be hear what they have to do, but they listened. Um, and we did a lot of internal um, and external educating. I think I did over 100 presentations during the time on focused deterrence. Just a quote here uh, from the circuit court judge in sentencing. Uh, we provided the video of our notifications that Mobile showed the picture earlier of all the opportunities that the offenders were offered. Uh, the, 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 again, the case management approach. And so when the offender reoffends and their defense attorney says they weren't given opportunities, that, that kind of goes out the window when the judges um, have an opportunity to look at them. So one person that I just want to highlight before Noble wraps up is uh, this was one of uh, the worst uh, offenders in our, in our initial groups with the most violent history. Um, and he, since he was notified, he's had no police contacts, no new victims. He has two jobs where he didn't have any jobs. And our, our unit actually referred, recommended he, he get the job for one that he put in, which is unique to our detectives to do. Um, the advocates helped him get an apartment. He's paying child support and spending time with his daughter. And he now, or he did back, back in the day, participated in the notifications, which we found were probably the most impactful. You've got the chief, you've got the U.S. attorney, you've got the whole, everybody up there. But when you hear from somebody who was in their shoes saying, listen to these people, uh, that, that really went a long ways. And then uh, just I want to highlight that uh, Professor Scott's uh, pop book on focused deterrence. And Mike, I'll give you an opportunity to say anything as well, but Noble, anything else that we... we sure, just, just one, one other thing, I, because I've heard in the presentations over and over again that sometimes um, it's, it's very difficult to sustain the effort when you're talking about problem solving. We were getting ready to go down a path before doing this of, of putting together a violent crime unit, which would have operated and functioned in a very traditional manner. Uh, and we would not have reaped any of the benefits that came out of this. And it wasn't until we sent... Um, uh, Tom and, and others out to research this that we, we reach this point. So sometimes we, we get caught up our own selves. We keep doing the same thing over again. So, Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I open it up uh, to questions, I want to back up their stories slightly. And I think this is uh, important in that um, Where this, uh, this initiative in Madison started, uh, David Kennedy, wh whose name may be familiar to many of you, had done some work with the Boston police, the High Point North Carolina police, testing out this concept of focused deterrence. And he had, um, he had published a book, uh, I think an excellent book, on deterrence, um, a scholarly book. And uh, I was 
had read it. I was very impressed with it. Some of my colleagues, Gloria Laycock, had read it. We had talked about it. A number of us were very impressed with this work, but it was a scholarly book. Uh, I happened to be asked to do some training in problem-oriented policing for the Madison Police Department. I did that regularly, and whenever I would go out to do it, the captain of the training division would order the lieutenant to take me to lunch. <laughs> and that was my payment for spending two days teaching. It just so happened at that time, Tom Woodmansey, uh, but probably much to his displeasure, was assigned to the training division as the lieutenant. So he, he was it. He had to take me to lunch. <laughs> so we went to lunch. And I, I'll tell you, I didn't really know, I didn't work with Tom uh, when I was an officer in that department, but he joined later. But I knew Tom's reputation. Uh, Tom was, had a, a good reputation, but not as a social worker. <laughs> he was a, uh, a good in police investigator. And so we had lunch, and we were just talking about nothing in particular, about just what he was interested in. And um, well, I just happened to be thinking about focused deterrence and sort of laid the idea on him over lunch. And I could tell he wasn't biting, <laughs> <laughs> at least not, uh, not initially on this. But uh, I, I said, I guess, enough to him. I offered him David Kennedy's book. So hey, just give it, give it a read. And this, I think, is all to Tom's credit. He read the book. He really read the book, <laughs> the whole book. And uh, you know, this is, he took it to heart, and he read it, and he thought about it, and he thought about it. And then he came, and I was able to offer him a, a law student to help with some background research, because he quickly realized that if we were to try something like this in Madison, he'd first have to convince the chief, who was probably going to be equally skeptical. And then he was going to have to educate an awful lot of people, police officers. Um, Tom might not even know this, but I also happened to have a meeting one day with the chief uh, federal judge, who just having a meeting in his office, and in comes the chief U.S. attorney. And the three of us are talking. I happen to mention this concept of focused deterrence to the chief prosecutor. He was having none of it. He thought this was the dumbest idea he had ever heard. And so I knew, in going back to Tom, that he had a tough row to hoe, uh, a tough job ahead of him to sell this to an awful lot of critically important people. Tom actually spent a solid year laying the foundation, educating himself first, then beginning systematically to educate a lot of people within and outside the police department. The point, and I think he succeeded in selling this to an awful lot of people. By the time he held that first notification meeting, which I happened to go to, the level of support, enthusiastic, committed support from both the law enforcement officials, 20 plus of them, the social workers who were there to offer assistance, uh, was remarkable. I don't think I could have predicted that. It was, the idea is radical enough that it required that level of education to get to that point. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up to any comments and questions for both the Aurora Project and, and Madison. Um, a question for both projects, uh, is there if you look back on the people that were selected for your projects, so the offenders, you call uh, some of them disease spreaders or they were repeating offending. And I want to know, is there anything in common with the people that were the, the most successful in the projects? What were the good choices that you made? Was there anything in common do you understand my question? Yes? So with the, the gang leaders, was there something that sort of in common with them? Um, who succeeded? The ones who succeeded. Yeah. Oh, you saw more of that than I did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. For, for, for us, I, I think there was a... a I, I, Grab the microphone. Oh, sorry. I think you just talk into it. it should yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. That's a great question, because we asked that in analyzing, you know, even in the selection, there were questions during, in the committee, who's most likely to succeed? And we would not let ourselves go there because it has to be about intervention. 
Um, some of the members really of the committee wanted it. We want to turn the success around. Um, one of the offenders who was on our first group, uh, his MO was handcuffing 14-year-old girls and sexually assaulting them repeatedly. And after his notification, to our knowledge, he didn't do that, and he got a job. Now, there are people that were shocked that he was still living in our community, um, but he was different than Jesse Payton, who was on the screen up above, who had just a horrific childhood and didn't have any support whatsoever. So I'm not answering your question. Well, I can't give you, and Noble, go ahead. Yeah, um, go, yeah, go take it from sure. here. But, um, success with this uh, initiative as well as with others, and we would get that feedback from them, depend, depending upon a lot if they got a job. Now, the, the challenge that we had was that uh, the resource people that were there were there doing job training. Okay, so they had to do job training before they can get a job. And, you know, they're struggling even before they're part of the program already. Uh, so that, that was part of the challenge. If they got a job, that increased their rate of success. It did, and there were some that were very challenging, and we had to go to court on one, and he, he needed housing. Uh, he committed a homicide, and we, we found him some housing. He did not like the housing, and the judge actually said out loud, the unit's not meeting this man's needs, and we were like, we got him a place to live. He didn't like it. So it was, it was very difficult to gauge what worked and what didn't work. The one thing I would say that we were surprised about the level of mental health needs in the population. That was something that, that took some of us by surprise, that they, that was the number one intervention need that they had beyond substance abuse, beyond housing, childcare, anger management. It was mental health treatment. So I hope that helped. Maybe I'm, I'm gonna follow up with a, a generalized question. So I'm gonna, am I on here, Mike? Yes. Okay, Mike, Mike. All right. Um, so in terms of thinking about how we have some departments now with um, addicted populations will actually approach the police department because they've marketed this idea that we're here to help you and not arrest you. Um, and the mental health aspect gets involved in this as well. Um, I'm wondering if there is a point to where our departments will actually evolve into this. So for example, you mentioned the mother that said, can you help my kid, right? Is, is there ever a time, and maybe as, through your police leadership, you might be able to address that as well, that we won't just say that it's addicted populations, that we will essentially open our doors to, we'll open our door to any kind of offender that's willing to change around their life. And it really does get to this assumption, I think, that society oftentimes carries, is that these offenders want to be living these lifestyles. And again, I, I reflect on David Kennedy's work that, you know, they, they are all driving Range Rovers and they have all of this money and it's not true, they're all living with their moms and they can't pay the light bill and all these sort of things. Um, could, could we envision that police departments would operate at that level? I'll let you guys answer. I, I think um, as, an, as an entree, as, as coming in, as a, as a conduit, I think there's some opportunity there. But one of the things that we've really tried to stress, and that's why the notification was done in a way where uh, the community members, uh, support resource people, provided their own input. After they were notified, they would go to their corners of the room, and they would actually sit down and talk to the offenders. Uh, so it, it, it was important to make that shift, because when I started talking today, one of the things that I said was, as, as chief of police that you always struggle with, when the crisis hits, when the calls are there, you don't have the resource support people there. And it's very frustrating. The community does not want to hear at the time of a homicide that, you know, that this person didn't go to school, that this person was suffering from trauma, that this person, they don't want to hear that. They want you to deal with that. So we're actually shifting that by having the, the folks that can provide the support in the room. And I would, I would say it's a great question. And the challenge is what was talked about in the opening introductory remarks with Herman this morning was the police cannot solve the problem. They cannot arrest their way out of the problem. And when we formed what Mike was talking about earlier, I was shocked how easy it was to get the law enforcement contingency together on the same page. We had several people, DEA, FBI, going, you're going to help these people? Hang on a second. But they understood it. The challenge was getting the people in the community who are there to provide support and help on the same page and working as a team for us. When that happens, then I think you have a created the potential for sustainable 
behavioral change with individuals. Yeah, I'd like to ask Noble, only because I know he and I have had this conversation a bit, but um, he showed you previously the demographics of the offenders who were targeted in this initiative, with 86% being African American, I think only 6% being white. In the city of Madison, even it's probably close to exactly the opposite in terms of the demographics of that city, 86% white and closer to 6% African American. How did you perceive, how did you avoid, I suppose, the perception in the community with the sensitivities about racial disparities that this initiative was not just yet one more way of the police picking on, discriminating against uh, African American young men? A couple of things, and Tom has talked about uh, some of them. One is having the community participate in the process. That, that was key. Uh, number two was um, getting out there and talking about it. Talking about what, what is it going to do, how it's going to impact, not shying away from the fact. I mean, the reality is if we didn't do this, we still got disparities. We still have racial disparities. So being very open, honest, and candid about you know, what, what was going to happen. Uh, the third thing, and this is one of the underlying issues that exists with David Kennedy's work, and more importantly, um, uh, Herman's work, and that is, I think people can see um, that if you are relying on a, a traditional police response constantly, constantly police response, I think people can see if you're trying to actually solve a problem. One of the consistent things that you've heard uh, today in a lot of the presentations is that it takes bringing the community together. And once you can bring them together and then solve and start working, focusing on the problem, that is legitimacy at its best. But those three things, you know, getting out, communicating, making them part of the process, and the underlying issue is we want to solve a particular problem. And the humanity, I thought, was brought with it by having the resources there along with it, that moral voice that we talked about. I, I just need to add, because Noble's too modest, having a leader in the community who represents not just the police department, but Noble represented the community saying, this is what we're gonna do and why we're going to do it made all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. um, Brandon, I guess for, likewise for you in Aurora, different racial demographics of the city, um, but there was a strong element in that initiative of trying to help these young men, young men who'd done some bad things. Was there some pushback from the community uh, that you detected? You know, I didn't hear a lot. Um, I don't think before those statistics were shared by the police that the community knew that, but I will say that there is some underlying talk that goes on in every community that looks at the race issue and the crime link, and the assumption is exactly how it sounds. And until you have an honest conversation, and Noble was talking about this as well, in terms of what the police efforts are with that community in order to address it, be upfront, and say, you know, this is the variety of responses that are going to be needed. The society, I think, today wants that one magic bullet. We want that one response to work. And what I think that we've seen time and time again with successful problem-oriented policing projects is that it's a multitude of responses. Some are successful, some are not, uh, but there's never gonna be usually one thing that's gonna be a cure-all and a fix-all. Um, again, I think the, the guiding lesson for me in that project was the comprehensiveness that was involved um, through a lot of different elements. Uh, and again, you know, I'll highlight that this took years to accomplish. This wasn't something that was done uh, in a month, and, and certainly, you can see that sustainability is going to be a struggle as well. Thanks. Gary? Maybe either Tom or Noble, one or the other of you let it slip that there was a federal lawsuit. So, so I'm guessing that uh, <laughs> despite all your uh, leadership and transparency, somebody didn't like it a lot. Um, if you could just fill us in on that. And then also I'm curious to what extent Madison and Aurora were even the least bit aware of what the other was doing because you're not that far apart. No, it's interesting. I was just thinking I was asked uh, last year to go down and, and present on focused deterrence to seven Illinois agencies, and I'm sure Aurora was one of them, and I don't know where that ended up. Um, but, but Gary, the, the lawsuit came about from the first group, um, and he had the most criminal charges of anybody in our population, and he was a serial domestic and, and child abuser. 
um, and he, he claimed that it was a civil rights violation, and it went all the way to the Seventh Circuit um, in Chicago, and our selection committee process uh, is what I think the judges looked at, and, and basically what we put up there is our philosophy. You, you selected yourself for this, and they looked at it as not punitive, which is good. We're not, we're not asking the judges or court to do beyond what they're capable of. I, would, I was stomping my feet going, why aren't they suing the judges? <laughs> you know, we're just, we're, we're, we're giving them a message and we're following through with it. Um, so it, 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 the judges looked at it as, hey, you had opportunity, uh, and, the, and they threw the case out. And uh, I'm surprised there aren't more of these, especially with, uh, with group targeting, you know, mm -hmm. with group going down that path. And I've had that discussion with Kennedy, so. No, I, I think he's, I think it was well stated. Um, last year, I had several uh, discussions with the command staff at the Royal Police Department to bring in uh, focused deterrence. Um, you know, I hope that we'll be able to do that at some time. Um, the um, the uh, IACP, um, inter the, uh, the Criminal Justice Information Authority in Illinois had a grant um, that was available specifically on focused deterrence. And, and I think three, <laughs> yeah, and, and un unfortunately, I think something had changed through the grant to where there needed to be matching funds and that the, the uh, city was like, where are we getting matching funds from? And it, it just sort of fell through. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you have some research obviously supporting these kind of initiatives and um, it's a struggle. On, on one hand, as Mike alluded to, Tom had, he knew he was, he was up against it in terms of convincing the important players that, hey, this is gonna be a good uh, police strategy to focus in on. Uh, and then of course, everybody's looking for money as well in terms of, well, if we're trying something new, there has to be a grant that's attached to it, that sort of thing. And, you know, I think one of the lessons that I've had over the years is that um, it doesn't always take money to do good problem-oriented policing. And you can see projects being very successful and we can highlight no federal funding needed, no state funding needed, uh, but convincing oftentimes police chiefs that, you know, this is a way of doing police business as opposed to a specialized unit that is going to experiment. Um, you know, we're talking different kind of languages at that point. Um, and too often, I think you see some of these things fall through uh, because there's not that grant or if you go after a grant and you don't get it, that means that, well, we can't do it. Well, you know, it, it's a struggle to um, change around that police culture oftentimes. Mike, can I just, yeah, just add one thing? Uh, you, when you asked our earlier question about, you know, why didn't the community react, there are, there are two other reasons why I think we did not get an, an adverse reaction. It is part of the, the initiative. Um, one is, uh, you know, involving the influencers. Uh, when you're going to have accusations of race, racism or bias, a lot, of that, a lot of times that's coming from the family. If you're reaching out to the family with home visits, etc., then you're making that connection. You get a, you get a chance to talk about it. Um, the, the second thing uh, with that, and this is, this is, this is vitally important, uh, every community uh, has has to understand that what you're trying to do is not focus on the entire community. You're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. And this particular initiative does that. They self-select in, but you're not doing a broad uh, brushed approach. So some of those things, I think, were also drivers in that. I'd like to ask a, a variation on a question that in the previous session, Ron Clark had asked of Rick Linden when he was describing uh, the initiative in Manitoba related to auto theft, which had two major elements to it. And Ron's question fundamentally was, do you really know which of the two worked? Might the whole thing have worked as well if you'd only done one of those? So this focused deterrence idea is at minimum a blend of fairly serious threat of punishment, mm -hmm. but married with a very serious offer of assistance. In your dealing with the offenders and your sense of this, would this have worked with one or the other of those approaches, or did they have to be married together? You want to try? I personally think they they have to be married together. Um, it, you know, you, you, you we talk about. Uh, levers, we talk about influencers, but it is very difficult to get people motivated to do things when they have spent their whole life falling between the cracks. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't see one functioning without the other. They already, they already function that way right now, and, and look, at, look at our results in many respects. And I would say it, it's got to be a fluid process mm -hmm. and, and meet, customize it to the needs and capacity of your community. I, I've, 
I've taught focused deterrence in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where their notifications are dialogue with the offenders. They bring them in, they say, what do you need? We're here to help you, but they have one person over there saying, but we're watching you. And I've been to other cities where they've got a little person in a corner with a resource table and 12 people up there saying, we're going to get you, we're out to get you if you mess up. So you have to get the balance right, and I'm, I support exactly what Noble said. It, it, I think it is, they work in conjunction with each other. They give the, the candidate offender an option to make a decision. What's in my best interest? They're telling me if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm gonna to go to prison. Either, either I believe them or I don't. So I take it both, both the threat of punishment and the offer of assistance have to be equally sincere. And followed up by. Okay. I'll just real quickly make mention, there was something that always sort of highlights in my brain when I hear different presentations. I forget which one of you said it, but that at some point you say, you know, hey look, the criminal justice system failed you, we're here to try other things. That's a really powerful message when you're sending that idea that we can try to do this in a different way rather than repeating what we've done over and over again. That cannot be said in one setting and all of a sudden the public's gonna say, oh, the police must have changed. Again, I think that's gonna take months of planning, preparation, reinventing the way that we do the job. Um, again, think about your own personal relationships. You can't claim that you have a relationship with somebody that you just met. You had a, a meeting, right? A relationship takes a while. The police that are gonna do this kind of work, I hope, you know, in these communities where they're doing it, that they put in the time and the preparation to actually make this work and be effective. Um, we spent months and oftentimes years uh, destroying our relationships with our communities. Um, I won't hopefully say that it's gonna take as long, uh, but it's certainly gonna take some time um, and really uh, some authentic efforts to reestablish that relationship before we jump into these kind of models. Great. Thanks. Johannes? Um, you are talking about now the how the individual offenders reacted. But there is also another idea that this will also be a message to other potential uh, offenders. Have you done any studies or trying to measure that effect? I can address yeah. that. So we, we actually developed, I, we didn't have time to pr pr present that, but we call it a tier two approach. Because whenever we do these discussions or presentations, the question, inevitably asked is, what about the youth, the juveniles, the ones headed that way? So we took it out, um, expanded it to one of our police districts. We brought in one 16-year-old who had a gun offense. He came with his mom and his younger brother. His dad was in prison. We met at a church, and we had a small mini uh, collection together. Uh, we brought food, so it was a much more subtle um, he went on to get arrested later for a gun offense, so it didn't have the impact we wanted, but that was an approach that we, we what we did was we pr provided the list that we showed you earlier, the, uh, the bulletin, and he knew the people on that. And we had one of them come in, the, the, the gentleman who was successful, and talk to him directly. Not a scared straight, but here's what you need to hear. It was very, very powerful. It was very resource intensive, though, for one person. Um, but that was what we started. I don't know where it is in the department now. But no we have, um, oh, did you? No, no. Oh, okay. We have uh, one additional retired Madison police officer in this room. Uh, Jim Dexheimer was a sergeant in the department, seated next to Herman. I don't want to put you on the spot for this because it's not actually a question so much for you, but it turns out that uh, Jim's daughter was also a Madison police detective and actually was a member of the Special Investigations Units and she worked in this. Do you, is there anything, feel free to say no, Jim, uh, that you could relay about uh, your daughter's impressions of carrying out the work that Tom Woodmansey was asking her and colleagues to do? Uh, Sam, my daughter, uh, loved the assignment in the Special Investigations Unit. She was really, she bought into Tom's idea that uh, what they were doing, and she actually stayed with it for six years rather than the, the four that were normal. She had to get extensions. And so last year, un unfortunately, um, the work was not appreciated by the, 
uh, people who make the decisions, and so the program's been gutted. They went from four or five detectives to, down to two last year, and this year they went down to one. Uh, but the, Sam found it very rewarding. She, she connected with these offenders. She was uh, just so gratified when one of them uh, appreciated what she was doing and that they'd, they held a job for the first time in their lives. And they were showing pictures of their kids. And, and that personal relationship uh, with people uh, who appreciated what they were doing for them. Uh, I just want to relate one story. I, I think this was two years ago at Thanksgiving. Uh, Sam and another detective, Claire McCoy, um, that because they got close to the, their clients that they were working with, they decided to bake some pies for Thanksgiving. And they went around and distributed them to their clients, and and uh, it was very emotional. They got uh, hugs from everybody, and and people were crying and saying nobody had ever done anything like that for them before in their lives. So. I doubt many of us who work as police officers ever <laughs> baked a pie for anybody we arrested. So that is, it, it's remarkable. It's remarkable, yeah. It's sort of, uh, and this point about, um, about the program and where it is today echoes something that Rick Linden had been talking about in the previous session about the, the fragility of some of these even very good ideas. You know, a very good idea is not guaranteed in, in this somewhat political world in which police operate to, to thrive. These ideas, they don't sustain themselves. They have to be sustained by successive administrations and leadership, and that doesn't always happen. Any final comments, questions? If not, uh, join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you.